you for, for joining us uh, and joining us in the final installment of our food security and climate resiliency series. Um, honestly, this, this topic could not be happening at a more timely moment uh, in, in our history. And this is a lot of what we've touched upon in the uh, previous three sessions. There's a lot going on, as we all know, in the, on the planet right now. We're coming off the back of a pandemic that has created all sorts of supply issues. Um, and now we have a major geopolitical event uh, that is threatening to block 30% of the, the world's wheat, um, which is going to have even more implications for inflations, which is already at a 40-year high. Um, this is... This is certainly the topic du jour at the World Economic Forum in, in Davos, um, and there's real concern about the health of, of consumers. And as always, when you have these type of issues, uh, it's the most vulnerable that end up getting hurt, hurt the most. So um, very much looking forward to another insightful uh, conversation from our panelists. Um, just a quick reminder to those that are new to, to rethink uh, sustainability initiatives. Um, these are these are the type of events that we look to encourage. Um, we, we want um, smart, forward-thinking panelists to come and, and debate ideas. And this is really a forum uh, for us to listen um, and learn. Um, we, we don't claim to have a one true opinion at RSI. Um, we're about collaboration. Um, and, um, and listening and uh, getting the best ideas to the fore. Uh, so very much looking forward to another uh, engaging uh, panelist discussion uh, today. Today's focus is, is really looking forward to the, to the future. So a, a bit of a culmination of uh, the previous three talks that we've had, but really focusing on solutions um, and a, a continuation of focusing on how how we can improve. Um, the, the first webinar was really a, a focus setting the scene. So we heard from the Daily Bread Food Bank about how much um, of an increase there has been in, in need over the past two years, um, as well as um, an app that is fighting food waste um, and an expert on, uh, on food waste and inequality. Uh, so that was very much setting the scene, ground level, and from there, we moved to a farming focus, uh, and we heard from both urban and rural uh, agriculture on the needs to, um, to really encourage more people. A big part of the message was, was just encouraging more people to take on farming and, and um, ele elevate the status of farming as a noble profession uh, to encourage more food security. Um, and then from there, we, we moved last week to a focus on processing. We heard from McCain's, uh, a, a very large company, um, as well as a, a large international company, as well as a, a local circular economy um, based company that's, that's using um, waste from microbreweries to create their own delicious bread. Um, and, uh, and then this week, we're really gonna focus on, on the future. Where, where are we going from here? Um, as, as mentioned, you know, a big theme right now seems to be moving from this just, just in time to just in case, uh, because uh, we're, we're realizing um, these supply disruptions that are occurring globally and the need for greater localization. Um, so this is one of the, the topics that we're going to be exploring is well, what does the future look like? How do we redesign these systems um, so that we have a greater food security um, and as well um, a byproduct uh, is having a more sustainable planet? So I'd like to hand things over to our founder of RSI, Yasmin Fanbell, who's an innovation strategist, an implementation advisor, uh, and as mentioned, the founder of, of Rethink Sustainability. Over to you, Yasmin. Welcome, everybody. That was a wonderful introduction, Patrick. It really set the stage for our very dynamic and insightful conversation today. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in everyone's bio. You'll meet them individually. But just as a high level, Dr. Kim Zuli is an, has a PhD in agroeconomics, and she works in the US as well as Canada and globally. Kate McMurray has, is a registered um, nutritionist and health practitioner, and she works with the Big Carrot. 
Mike Carter, his background is both on the farming side, actually growing up on a farm, as well as engineering and uh, energy with a couple of companies, which we'll talk about, with a focus today on agrivoltaics. And Phil Thong is an engineer, and, and today's focus is Hyde Garden, which he's the founder and president of, which is, he'll tell you all about that as well. Next slide, please. I would invite everyone today to look at things through two lenses, a futures lens and a systems lens. The futures lens means reimagine what's possible, what's probable, and most likely to happen. So if we get stuck in the past only, we regurgitate what happened before. And as Kim will talk about, when she's going to talk about what does a city and a community in the future look like, just for a moment, go back 50 years, if anyone's old enough to remember that, or, or at least can read about it. 50 years ago, what we have today did not exist, and some of it would have been seen as science fiction. Well, imagine 50 years from now being only 10 years from now because change is happening faster and it's also in the market reach is, is larger as well. So if, from using this, putting on a futurist lens, which is you always say, what's that possible future? And then you do a market scan and say, what are some of the emerging trends and disruptions that are either reinforcing the probability of that vision or negating that? And then once you, you go through all that kind of iteratively with the other people, then you, you focus on what's possible and you work out a plan to do that. But again, it's very iterative and then you keep, do the full loop and, and it keeps going on and on. There's no one line and it happens concurrently and collaboratively. So in addition to the, to the, uh, to the challenges that were presented by Patrick, we, there are two categories of disruption that I wanna bring your attention to. You're all gonna get this PowerPoint so you don't have to memorize the bubbles. But there's one is immediate threat and one is called chronic. Immediate threats are the war in Ukraine, which, which Patrick talked about, which is, as we can all see, is not only affecting the supply chain and the, and the labor shortage, it's also creating mental health and violence around the world, which is very sad. It, it, it's very unsettling. The other thing is that's really also is the, the, even though the pandemic is kind of near the end, we hope, we still have the COVID hangover and we now have other things that are being talked about publicly. And we also have a challenge to our human rights as people. On the chronic side, which is still a threat uh, to some extent, is climate change. And, and you'll see that in, in things like extreme weather, like the fires, for example, in New Mexico and out west, like the, the storm we had last weekend, right? and so on and so forth. Then we have also inequality of income and that's around economics and, and inflation is a big one. So look, when you get this slide, look at that and say in your own organization, your own community, your own city, what, how, what are some of these trends in your area and how are they affecting the solution that you're focusing on either individually or collectively? Now RSI does, we're kind of a bridge between these different sects. We're a bridge between communities we're a bridge between communities and cities. We're a bridge between corporations and also other organizations. A few years ago, it was always a top down, look at everything but top down, making money, that was it. Then it was bottom up from a grassroots perspective. When we did that with a project we just finished called the Community Climate Action Initiative in St. Jamestown, now we're looking at bridging the gap between communities and cities. That'll be talked about a little bit here and, and, and why that's really important going forward to keep that mindset. So in, in summary, adopt a, a futurist mindset, a systems mindset, look at how the trends in the marketplace are reinforcing the possibility and legitimacy of one solution, identify the gaps in terms of competencies and who we can partner with to fill the gaps. And that's called co-opetition. That was talked about last week by Dr. Um, Ashalawa. So in the past, we talked about cooperation and, con and competition. We put those two words together, that's an example of the future. I'm excited to talk to you, or have you introduce rather, Dr. Kim Zuli. Uh, Dr. Zuli is a very esteemed um, economist, as well as being the managing director uh, and the founder of Feeding Cities. She's a former academic as well, and an advisor to different countries, US and Canada being two of them. She's going to talk to you about what does the future of cities look like and the future of communities look like, and then bring that back to how does that connect with food? Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Yasmin. 
Really appreciate that. Thanks to Yasmin and Patrick for giving us this opportunity today. I'm really excited to be here and for the entire RSI team. Yasmin has asked me to uh, talk about the future of cities and uh, food security all in five minutes. So let's see if I can get that done. So obviously this is going to be very, very high level. So the, the future of cities, um, you know, we've heard a lot about cities shrinking a bit uh, and people moving out of cities with the pandemic, but long-term trends, cities are growing really important as, as political entities in their own right. And um, income inequality has always been there in cities that continues to grow. One of the facets linked to food is there's always been, still is really a lot of inequities in terms of access, physical access to food. So not only differences in what food people can afford to purchase, but actual physical access to that food within cities. And then cities are, at, as we all are, right? But they're at increased risk or we have larger populations at increased risk of all sorts of shocks, including natural disasters. And raise the slide shows disasters have changed uh, in the past few decades because of climate change, increased frequency, increased severity. We already heard it's gonna be another really, really bad hurricane system. We've already had tornadoes in the Midwest where, where I live in the US. So lot, we know the disasters are happening. We, you've heard through great you know, events like this and other where the food system is changing. People understand that they're addressing it. What I know from having worked on the food system and I don't want to give away my age, but several decades, uh, we've been working on sustainable agriculture and those issues for decades. The, the food system is entrenched. It sort of is, you know, it's not saying that it won't change over time, but that will be a long time. In the meantime, we know that we're going to have these massive disasters now, right now. And as a result of that confluence of, hey, we're having these disasters now, the food system hasn't changed. And guess what else hasn't changed? The institutions and the planning associated with what people think of as emergency food. And our work in cities, right, what it's exposed to us is that cities, and this is where, right, the, the problem is going to happen. And so cities are going to have to address it. Their plan is rely on FEMA, rely on Red Cross, rely on the food bank, those organizations right, have sort of a two week, this is when we provide emergency food. And emergency food now, what we call it, it's sustained emergency food. And that's what institutions and planning needs to uh, uh, realize, right? It's not a two week window, it's months, it's years. We heard earlier uh, in one of the sessions for this, someone said there's been a 40% uptick in the need uh, for food in Canada after the pandemic. That's what we see after every disaster. New York City collected data after their last hurricane, Sandy. There was an increased demand for food a year after the event. So we see these sustained emergency situations, but again, the, the planning, the institutions haven't kept pace. We need a completely different narrative around this while we're thinking about redesigning the system. I created a company around this. Uh, I was working at a nonprofit around it. It grew out of that as we work with cities and realized it is shocking that cities don't have plans in place. So right now, the, the, the food system from this perspective and, and who handles uh, emergency food, it's at the, so food security, right? It's handled at the federal level and then the very local level, which means it's philanthropic and volunteer-based. And that may have worked through the past spot crises that we had in the past 100 years, but in this new current age of massive cascading, transpoundary, whatever you wanna call it, all the disasters we're seeing, we need cities to come up with a plan and resources that are not ad hoc, not considered emergency, but considered their, um, you know, to be there at all time to tackle these crises. So 
So I simply created the company because nobody else is tackling this problem. No one is trying to change the narrative. We can't farmer market our way out of this. We can't container garden our way out of this, right? All of those are important. Urban agriculture, tremendously important. Local agriculture, tremendously important. But it will take a while before those can be scalable enough to feed a city. In the meantime, we have the research and the assets to help cities pull together plans that leverage um, again, all of their assets and resources to, to help think about how to really do this in the interim. And I was just saying, we're just going to capture and leverage the research, the innovations, the experts, practices out there on this new platform around sustained emergency food. We're going to test the models and strategies on the ground in real time. It's why I left academia. We don't have time for three-year journal articles to come out on this. This isn't an academic problem. It's an implementation problem. We need to amplify the findings. So again, thank you, RSI. Thank you, Yasmin, for this opportunity to help transform the thinking and change the narrative. And I think that is it. The next person speaking is, is uh, Kate. McMurray and Kay is, as you can see on screen here, is an outreach and education professional. Her background is she's a certified uh, nutritionist, works in the health sector, and works on better, building better food literacy in the community, and also fostering partnerships in the community where, where the big carrot happens to reside. Over to you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, for that introduction. It's great You're to welcome. be here today. Um, so as Yasmin mentioned, uh, I am a nutritionist and I work at The Big Carrot uh, as an education outreach coordinator and I also run our donation program. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with The Big Carrot, we are a natural food market that has been around for 39 years. We have two locations in the east end of Toronto, one on the Danforth and one at Kingston Road and Main. And we are a full grocery store, but we also have a juice bar, a kitchen and deli, a bulk department, body care department and holistic dispensary. Uh, we are committed to providing healthy food options, but we are also really, really committed to building a healthy food system and a healthy community. And I'm going to get into the ways in which we do that in a little bit. Um, but another really unique thing about the Big Carrot is that we are a worker-owned company. So we were started by nine founding members, and we've grown to about 160 employees. And we allow any employee that has worked for three or more years to purchase shares in the company. And that includes a voting share. So as a business, we are held accountable not only to our customers and our community, but also our shareholders. And we are uh, committed to providing local, organic, non-GMO, and sustainable options. And these values are reflected in our purchasing policies, as well as uh, advocacy work and activism work that we do. And really, our model is, is all about transparency. It's our transparency and our integrity that has really enabled us to build a relationship of trust with our customers and uh, has allowed us to last 39 years. This uh, you know, industry has become increasingly competitive. And so it's really about, um, about that transparency and trust. We go above and beyond to provide information and also education opportunities. And that allows customers to make informed decisions really based on their own values and their priorities. And we also promote transparency in the food system as a whole. So we are advocating for third-party verification systems like the organic standard, the non-GMO project. And we were actually one of the founding members of the non-GMO project, which has become hugely recognized. So we're a lot more than just a grocery store. And what I'm interested in, what I'm interested in exploring today is really the ways that we foster uh, community and the ways we connect different communities. So looking at the producers, growers, as well as the consumers, the eaters, and then advocates of food and environmental justice, people that are uh, in activism and forward thinking. And I think that it's really the community building model where we're gonna find innovative solutions and really build resiliency, which is important from both a food system perspective and also uh, from a business perspective. So I look forward to getting into a bit more of a chat. Thank you, Kate. That was very insightful. We look forward to hearing more discussion about that. And now I'm gonna introduce you to Mike Carter. Mike Carter is a founder and partner of First Green Energy. Uh, his background is he grew up on a farm. I'll tell you all about that. He's also, his background is also energy, renewable power, 
And he, his lens today is looking at agrivoltaics. So without further ado, Mike, over to you. Thank you, Yasmin, and, uh, and thank you to everyone at RSI for having me in today. So, so my background growing up in a farm, uh, rural Ontario, which isn't quite so rural anymore, but I'm coming at you from my, my location outside of Halton Hills at the moment. And, uh, and we've uh, grow cash crops as well as other crops on our farm and have always been kind of deep in, in, the, in the community growing up for sort of generations around me. Uh, separately to that, I grew up in a renewable energy development uh, family where um, my father had started a, a hydroelectric development business from our family's living room. And through, you know, osmosis, I found myself working in that space as, as did my brother continues to this day. I moved into the solar world, uh, more focusing, uh, supporting a, a large um, multinational uh, manufacturing solar equipment, solar modules, as well as one of the world's largest uh, project developers. And so my my move into the renewable space was was really uh, doing the large utility scale solar. And, and there was always uh, and has forever been an issue for me uh, of taking out and the taking out agricultural land for the benefit of the renewable energy transition. And uh, our business, First Green Energy, um, is really trying to, I guess our original focus was to support the electrical, uh, electrical transformation, uh, carbon transition efforts any way we could and try to tackle the hard problems to solve. Uh, part of that effort, we found ourselves working um, for companies that were looking to integrate uh, technology into existing agricultural operations, specifically around greenhouse solar integration, as well as uh, agricultural solar integration or agrivoltaics or, or greenhouse integrated photovoltaics. And so that's where we find, uh, I guess, my professional and personal sort of crossroads is uh, growing up in the space, uh, really understanding that we grow corn on our farm and, uh, and learning over time how much of that corn actually finds itself in ethanol uh, feedstock as opposed to feeding people. And so I feel that the, the crossover of my involvement here is how do we sort of thread the needle between energy production, which is taking land out of usage, uh, looking at crops being grown for ethanol production, specifically around taking, yeah, taking land out for ethanol production, which is now, especially in the EV revolution, is, is seen as uh, generating about 100 to 200 times less kilometers driven uh, Per, per input piece. Um, there's roughly 40 million acres that are currently growing uh, ethanol that should be growing food crop. In particular, as we're talking about this Ukrainian crisis and trying to sort of balance the, the, the Russian oil needs and the US in particular raising their 10% to 15% um, ethanol mix in their fuel to meet the cost of fuel needs while taking more food out of people's mouths while we're looking at the bread, bread basket of, uh, of Europe being sort of uh, disrupted. So anyways, that's that's kind of the angle that I bring to the discussion and uh, and certainly very keen to uh, to, to, to talk further about um, my uh, experience around the space and where I think that um, there's a really, really compelling case for integrating more solar, keeping farms farming and, uh, and growing more produce um, through sort of optimized uh, integrated systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. That was very insightful. I uh, look forward to hearing more about what you're saying too in the panel discussion. Our next speaker is Phil Fung. Phil Fung is an engineer by training with a specialty in robotics. He's also a part-time professor at Humber College. Uh, he also is an engineer with an energy sustainability focus and the founder and president of High Gardens. And High Garden, he'll tell you all about that in his following slides, but just before I do, I wanted to say that you know he's he's a relentless champion of sustainability on many fronts, um, and with and, and one of his colleagues a few weeks ago talked about urban farming in the context of cities, and today the focus is going to be more about the future. Okay, Phil, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Fifteen years ago, uh, United Nation um, did a research on the natural ecosystems. The uh, status. 15 years ago, out of the 24 of them, 15 already been damaged. I won't be surprised as of today, all 24 have been damaged. So my design for a long time is how can I make every community as well as 
every building, every house be able to provide ecosystem services. This has been my overarching um, design principle. First of all, I look at a distributed model. You can, you, you can look at, um, compare with the uh, mainframe to mainframe, uh, uh, to mainframe um, computer, we are going in, into desktop and laptop. Distributed is how do we put farms um, into a distributed model into communities. So it means it will be a smaller scale, okay? And it should be integrated with every community planning. The community planning should, I really think in the future, it has to make uh, some kind of uh, farming as part of the community design in order the entire community, every building, they have a sense of food security, to be more resilient, to be more, in a sense, more self-sufficient. When we talk about community-based, we are, we are basically talking about people-centered. People-centered, the new food system, we, we have to look at food diversity because every community, they have their own uh, uh, cultural um, sensitiveness. So how can we bring this food diversity to every different culture in every different community? And two, when we talk about people, so people-centered, can we make every house as an organic farm? Can we help them? Can we train them? Train every household so such that they have a tool and knowledge to grow their own food, especially organic vegetables. Well, we don't, you know that we don't give fish to the people, we teach them how to fish. And doing that, we look into the food sovereignty. Okay, it means we, we, we give the, um, the ability to control the security and um, diversity back to the people in the community. When we talk about people-centered, we in fact talk about a health focus. Why do we do food? Health, survival, okay, with a more um, uh, fruitful life. When we talk about health, when we, we talk about one is the, um, the physical health, once you can control that you have a say to how you grow food, then the food safety uh, uh, will be there. What we have been doing is they're all um, Canadian organic certified, so food safety standard is there. More, more than that, I look at food as not just physical health, Food growing can provide mental health to enhance the mental health using what we call nature therapy. You know that uh, maybe uh, you know that nature therapy is now a prescription medicine in BC and Ontario. So means going during the process of growing food, we help people to have a better mental health. Overall, doing this distributed community-based people-based. Health, health focus, we want to put a regeneration, regeneration process back to the system. We want to have every community, every house, every building to be able to regenerate in order the natural ecosystem can be replenished. I look forward to, to the um, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. We're now gonna go into an open dialogue and take away all the slides. What I'm hearing there as a common thread is that the future really is already starting now. It isn't um, just about in, somewhere in the future. The future is right now. And, and the boundary between the future and now is a blur. What I also heard is coming the themes there is that there's one, one thing is looking at integrated crop growth. So it's integrated. The other thing I'm hearing about is really combining technology uh, as an enabler for both urban and rural growth as well as other solutions that might be a hybrid model. I'm also heard in the conversation that um, agriculture is not something just out there. It's, it's, it really needs to be looked at as a system in terms of helping people have be help, healthy lives, be community-based, people-based, uh, and health-focused. I've also heard from a community and city perspective that cities of the future you know, are also happening now, and it's not just some academic exercise. It's up to, to private sector to get involved too, not just the government, not just academics, and not just uh, philanthropists. This is something that has to be dealt with every day. And if nothing's gonna get our attention is the war in Ukraine. 
I mean, the whole uh, domino effect of, of the, the crane situation, grain situation rather, it's right in our face every day. I also heard, Kate, when you talk about, you know, it's really important to be community minded and inclusive and, and change the model from that of a top down to one that's more inclusive where everyone has a role to play and creating um, partnerships that might be unusual. So my question to all of you is based on the one takeaway you have or the key message that you have, and I'm gonna start with you, uh, Mike, cause I can see you there getting ready to talk. Do you want to expand on your, I know that I'll put you, this is a challenge. What, <laughs> imagine it's two years from now, what's one thing that you, that you and your group have accomplished with other partners that really talk about that one challenge you presented around a more integrated approach? And anybody else, please weigh, weigh in on this too after, after Mike says something. So, so within, within my, thank you, that's I think, so within my space, I, I think that the two-year goal would be to affect policy change at both a provincial and federal level to look at um, agricultural and, 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 and renewable or solar integration with agriculture. So in Ontario specifically, there are, there were safeguards put in place during the original feed-in tariff days to protect uh, prime lands from uh, uh, from being sort of overbuilt with uh, with solar and, and sort of taken out of the food system. I think that there is a path where we can incorporate both. And that would be what I'm really working towards, uh, again, with my partner, Pat, who's uh, who we all saw earlier, but uh, that's that's really sort of our, I think our big prize that we can both help ourselves, but also work, uh, work in collaboration with really the entire development community, but also uh, the agricultural growers, it will put more money in dollars in their pockets, ideally. And, uh, and I think from a, from a meeting federal and provincial as well as municipal policy objectives around the climate emergency, I think it sort of ticks a lot of those boxes. Um, so that's, that's what I, 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 it's coming in other jurisdictions. It's not here yet. We're working to try to transform that uh, sort of on a voluntary basis, but recognizing that that is also our profession how do we engage corporations and private sector into taking action based around that? So it's not left to academics or philanthropists. I think that's a great question. And, you know, in every city we're in, actually the private sector has been very willing to engage. Um, it is about finding the right partner in every city to convene private sector philanthropy and the public sector and that's hard to do in any city on any issue this is difficult it could be a major foundation it could be the city if they have that kind of power the problem with cities is there's not a single department or agency that owns the food problem it's really um, scattered throughout the city so it, right now there isn't a city set up that has a permanent food uh, a department that would be able to take it on. So I've never found the, I think the public sector is is waiting uh, in the wings to be engaged on this, Mike and those in the private sector, can, others in the private sector can weigh in on it. But yeah, it really is who's convening it. And for the public sector, someone, there was a great uh, chat conversation around, hey, did, did, did we know the Ontario food terminal is in a floodplain? Yeah, that's the type of research we've done. We absolutely do. It's documented. It never quite raises to a priority level for cities yet, again, because they delegate this to the philanthropic and private sector to solve on their own. I need to talk about, I think integrated community planning is part of the process. Okay. Uh, I really think food system should be part of it. It's like when we do com community planning, we have gardens, we have playground, we have parks, right? They're part of it, right? But I think like a food system should be part of it because if you look at food system, it's not just for physical health. A food system, it can possibly be doing, helping with the mental health of, of the um, um, people in the community, then I think we may have a different uh, mindset. Okay, so go, go, go to your um, second question. Yes, we have a, num uh, we have a project just, um, just Monday, you know, so we had um, we opened up our city of Brampton uh, off, off grid um, food shed, part of project. That is um, a cooperation uh, between of um, city of Brampton that how can we put community farming, com com community food sovereignty back to the um, community. And then we have um, part of project 
uh, you know, uh, in uh, at the um, St. James Town with a not for profit, and then we have a private sector, you know, in the Milton that we are building a large indoor farm for the purpose of serving the local communities. So it means both public and private, they do, they are willing to do something in order to serve the community. Yeah, where, do you, where do you begin? Like when you did that, those pilots, where, did, where was your starting point? Well, we have um, an innovative ideas and we introduced to Sierra Brampton. And Brampton, they have been doing, they have been encouraging com community farming. So combining community farming outdoor in our, our con container base uh, off grid. So they said, wonderful. So we can have year round and off grid. And an example of an off grid in an urban setting. So then they, the entire council, they, they, they approved the uh, project. The okay. city council, you went to the city council. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, what about yourself? Thank you. What about yourself with Big Care? How do you engage the community at large? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think what we do is we we really try to create a web and network of a lot of different communities. So we have a supplier community and we are connected with the farmers that are supplying us. We have a community, um, a customer community. We have a bigger sort of advocacy community. So connecting with groups like the Canadian Biotechnology Action Network, the Non-GMO Project, Organic Council. So we're also looking at, you know, a political level too. Um, and we have a number of different projects that are, are very community centered, um, which I think we'll get into in a little bit, like some grant streams that fund community centered projects. So there's, there's lots of layers there that we're trying to sort of, and levels we're trying to engage on. So thank you very much. So what, what's one of the key barrier that you're all facing in your respective domains? So like, I'm gonna start with you and what you're doing. So can you just explain one more time as a recap what your focus is and what the main barrier is? Sure, I, I mean, I think the key barrier, at least for, for any kind of level of scale is, is, is policy. There's a policy barrier, um, at least north of the border in our, in our backyard here. Um, and then because of the policy barrier, there's a, there's a really limited uh, availability of pilots or demonstrations or research um, and data coming out for integrated solutions and uh, and it's stifling innovation. I mean, we're we're certainly the systems that I'm looking at for integrating different types of crops are probably not where we're going to be looking at seeing deployed in five and ten years out. But I think that that you know we're really stifling um, the opportunity to sort of learn and adapt crops. And I just see that Brad had made a comment about you know we are seeing side benefits around. Uh, providing adaptive uh, solutions for uh, climate affected areas, in particular okay. Southern California uh, relationships we've had uh, reach out to us. And, and they're really fo focused on um, sort of controlled environmental agriculture, which can be greenhouses, but it can be other systems where, you know, it's hoop houses or, or areas that are trying to shield, uh, um, you know, product that you wouldn't typically grow in a greenhouse and maybe it's sort of an innovative way to prevent water loss, uh, provide shading, cooling um, in, in areas that are hyper constrained from, again, uh, California, sort of the primo example of, 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 of a real issue with snowpack loss right. and, uh, and uh, you know, the water just not coming back. But, uh, but Brad had asked some additional questions and I think, I don't purport to be that expert, but I think that we're, we're going to see a whole bunch of different um, solutions between changing crops um, and should we be changing crops? I, I don't know that I, 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 I have my own my own thoughts and in, in, in issues around growing certain things. Um, you know, because we like them fresh, local aren't. To Brad's point, there it aren't necessarily the most climate friendly solutions. Right. But, um, but that's part of a, the, the 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 broader sort of inputs and outputs, and I think the. The base case is: Can we stop growing as much corn and offset, you know, burning people's food to drive miles across the country um, and affecting a global system, which is my bigger issue? And it's we're just outsourcing deforestation when we start when we start right. boosting the cost of food um, domestically. So, thank you. How, how is that addressed at the big? Thank you, Mike. How do you address that at the big carrot? I mean, you you buy 
uh, organic food from local farmers, you bring into Toronto, you work with urban growers as well. How do you address that, 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 that barrier? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so we really prioritize local, uh, whenever we can, organic, non-GMO project verified. So we, we have committed to those, um, to those priorities. And um, we also, one really unique thing about the Big Carrot is that, as I sort of was mentioning earlier, we're trying to really build a better food system as well. So it's not just offering our customers better choices, it's also actively trying to build that system. And one way that we do that is through two grant streams. So we have uh, the Carrot Cash and Nature's Finest Fund, and they are both looking at sort of local innovators thinking about sustainability. Um, you know, Mike was talking about like hoop houses, like uh, energy efficient ways of growing greenhouses. These are the sorts of projects that we we can connect with. And so we really try to, you know, we're a grocery store at the end of the day, but we try to sort of be, we're a conduit. We're sort of a, um, a bridge between consumers and the people that are actually like in the field doing the projects. And our grant streams are really, um, quite unique I hope I don't know if now's the time to get into it Yasmin but no just no we'll do that later momentarily but what I will ask you is what at the demand side are you seeing people asking to Mike's point and your point and this, this is a question for everybody do you see uh, consumers demanding having a different demand in terms of the type of vegetation the type of food they want whether yeah, it's absolutely. animal food or vegetable food for sure and a big thing um that we really promote is is education and and you know, dialoguing with our, with our customers so that we understand what their priorities are and, and they understand what our priorities are. So we have buying guides that might, you know, distinguish between organic meat and meat that would have GMOs in the feed, like little granular details like that so that people can make decisions, um, you know, based on their priorities. And the same goes for local, you know, speaking to that, you know, are they, driving those organic strawberries across the country. You know, we get feedback on that all the time. Um, so we always try to incorporate as much local as we can. Yeah. So I guess the question is, is, is the demand change though? Are, are people, we have a couple of competing disruptions, inflation, which means higher price. And are people willing to pay more money for organic? Even though right now we're in, an, 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 you know, every session basically. Well, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a really big, challenge for us because we have as a business stayed committed so our organic um sorry our produce department bulk department kitchen you know they're all organic and we don't you know when the price of strawberries change we still have organic certified strawberries in our store so that is encouraging conversations with people so that you know if they're looking at that in february and going why do these strawberries cost eight dollars we're having that conversation rather mm -hmm. than rather than sort of um not being consistent we you know so mm -hmm. um the hope is that people then start to change their purchasing you know based on that understanding and then there is less demand for those goods at that time of year i mean we really need to get into seasonal eating which is a whole other conversation okay and, yeah thank you i'm going to broaden the lens here to a citywide and go over to you kim thank you very much for saying that okay so at a city level, I mean, we can't always be choosy about whether it's organic or not. And it's not minimizing organic. I, I buy organic when I can as well. So please don't hear that, Kate. I, I shop at the big carrot. <laughs> so, but on a, on a city-wide, not everyone can afford to pay higher price for certain types of food because they're, they're hungry, basically. So how do we feed cities? Yeah, so every city is unique. And I know um, with the organic and the local food system and farmer's market, et cetera, they're, they've done a ton in the last decade to make it accessible. They accept um, you know, what we call SNAP benefits in the US, but you know, food security benefits and they work with uh, food pantries and et cetera. So I think in general that there have been great strides in making um, organic and healthy and local foods, et cetera, accessible to everyone. So I just want to put that out there. Kate, you can disagree with me, but I think that that, that has been definitely happening in the U.S. The, what we work on is the problem of 
when cities have disasters of one type or another, whether it's social or natural disasters, feeding the cities in that in that event needs you need to think of like Kate's um, organization and and Mike's and any place that has food, restaurants, all of it becomes an asset. And that's part of what you can leverage to feed people in real time. Of course, they may be damaged, they, they may not have the labor, et cetera. So you have to take right. into all of that modeling account of how do you leverage these assets in the moment to feed it when you may not be able to bring in resources externally because right. if we have right catastrophic cascading disasters, there's not enough emergency food, et cetera. So it isn't a local food versus not. Um, you know, and and the difference in price for local and organic, honestly, that's not that's not the real, that's not tipping anyone over into not being able to afford food. Generally, right, that food security um, barrier is at a much lower price point anyway. Thank but you for Kate, Kate, that. please correct me if I'm not you want to weigh on that since since Kim directed something to you to have a comment a quick comment on that specifically about what sorry I'm not you want to say that again Kim oh sorry I'm just saying um I, I don't think you know pricing something a little higher because it's local right. or organic it makes more people find that unaccessible the 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 price point for most people going to food security is much lower anyway Right. Yeah, I would agree. Exactly. Yeah, okay. for sure. Want to go over to Phil, Phil, with your high guard and how do you address that? So I'm going to do a recap as a reminder to, to you and, and weigh in everybody else too. And what be mindful of the time as well. So with high garden, how do you address three things? How do you address um, the food insecurity from a price perspective, accessibility perspective? And also how do you scale up and scale out? Because I mean, Carrot Calm and Big Carrot is great at a community level. And I love, like I said, I love going there. I love how you, it's a whole systems approach, which is fantastic. How do we expand that at a whole citywide perspective or maybe even provincial or a US state perspective? How do we do that? How does High Garden do that? I, I saw a question asking that does the community planning uh, just apply to new community or how about existing? Um, the example, you tell us. yeah, you tell uh, us. yeah. Uh, the, the example is our Brampton project. You know, it, it is an existing community. So um, from from the opening uh, remarks from the council, uh, they want to roll out to 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 other communities in Brampton. So it is applicable. Okay, and two, uh, in our project at um, St Jamestown, we we in fact put the all how we grow or organic food tools into the apartments means they we 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 help them we train them. You know what? It's absolutely we can grow our own organic crops. Maybe they are not certified organic, but they are organic compliant. All right. I think the biggest thing is education. Education at different levels. E education to the consumers. Education to the politicians. Education to to the vendors. Okay, so when when consumer know why, you understand the uh, thirty dozen every year for the last five years. What is the number one strawberries? Why? That is a great reason. If people know why, maybe they will call. They will say, "Hey, you know what? <laughs> I'm a really sure that I want to get eat on on organic um, strawberries." It's education because they they they, they saw on this, but but they they don't know why. Same as the politicians, right? So once they know, they see the part of project, say, hey, you know what? Resiliency, climate resiliency. This is how we make the community to be more resilient now. I'm gonna build on what you just said, Phil, in that around the education. Let's take education and incorporate that using your all, you all use the word integrated. How do we integrate education into right across the whole supply chain? So it's not just in school or here, it's all connected. Any thoughts on that? So it's, I call that action learning. So it's learning that it's not just theoretical. It's action learning that is right in where, where things happen. Like the Montessori school, for example, they, uh, I love that model because it really is experiential learning in the community, in the, in the ground with nature as an example. 
take that or another model. I mean, let's take yourself, Kim, you used to be a professor before, correct? So take your academic professorship and yourself, Phil, as well, and take it to where you are now outside the academic realm. How do we incorporate education that leads to action and, then, and else that can be scaled? Anybody, Kim, do you want to talk about that or anyone? Maybe. Mike, okay. You, you, you mentioned the Montessori school. So I'm just going to just, tonight is my uh, my planting with my my son's uh, daycare day. So they're having an, a, it's a it's a it's a regional uh, daycare office and so oh, awesome. they, so they're how, so how old is that how old is your son he's, uh, he's four so we're, so we're so it's a fam all of the families are, are to come together and plant and i i really think and, and actually last night he and i planted our little personal garden um yeah. as well and uh in it's it's seeing what it takes to grow what we I, I think having that 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 real connection and consistently I mean, he won't remember if he doesn't keep it up from the age of four onward to, to where we are at now. And, and again, I think I think what I bring to my current undertaking, it's the it's the it's everything I've been exposed to my whole life. And we're talking about markets. I I'm my office is our old farmer's market. So this is where I'm coming from. And we were trying to sell. We grew. We had five acres of organic strawberries or organically grown strawberries. And um, and uh, it was uh, it was a, at that time close to 20 years ago, people were going, well, those guys four miles down the road are selling them for X, how are you selling? So we had to sell the same and we had, you know, we did not spray, we did not, you know, there were a number of issues, but things have changed a lot since then, but it, being close to it, being around it. So just consistent education, new exposure, being open to new things. There's my starter point. That's a great one. Anyone wanna weigh on that, Kim, wanna weigh on? Yeah, I think it depends on the issue. And, and I think there's a lot of focus on K through 12 and to change food patterns, change, you know, how children are thinking about all sorts of things, which is amazing and wonderful. And again, great for the long term. But for, you know, what we're working on, which is this real near term, that is a adult education and policy education problem. So it's not going to be in any school system. It's really about more what Phil was referencing, like bringing together these planning groups, the right groups in each cities. Most cities have food policy councils. That's not quite the right group. They need to be leveraged, but we need right different groups needing to come together in a different way to persuade cities to make this a priority. I agree with you, by the way, we did that in a project we did last year, we just finished in March and we brought together different partnerships from around the world. We had seven countries rep represented. And uh, to your point, Kim, it was really incorporating the learning, the action learning into all levels of decision makers and influencers, including policymakers. A gap that we witnessed though, which I wanna talk about is, is between the different partners. There wasn't a, a same level of commitment between the partners. so. Uh, we have a few minutes here. So going back to the partnership, who are the most, let's start with yourself, Phil, on the, the pilots that you did in Brampton, Melton, and also in Toronto. What were the key steps for engaging partners and how did you know which are the right ones and how? From a competency point of view or, or an implementation point of view? A number of our projects, they actually came. I, I did not go after my my partner sort of, you know, mm -hmm. but they they knew what we are doing and they are interested. Okay. And I understand this is not the majority, that this is fine, you know, is uh, maybe just a small group, you know, you know, so but um let's say the Milton project, okay, it's a much bigger uh indoor farm that the owner is a private, you know, setting that right. they he wants and he he works with the local politicians and the local pro, uh, politicians support him. So right now we are building and then he will go to serve the local communities. So I really think uh, we need to tell people what we are doing and um, we need to go to the politicians and tell them, hey, you know what, um, how do you deal with the um, climate uh, resiliency here? So food is a big thing. So um, yeah, this is how, how we do it. So, but, but once we have the part of project, it will be a lot easier. That I can go you, have many, you have something tangible to show people. Yes, you know, I can go to many um, uh, cities now, right? Come yeah. and see. Yeah, thank you. 
Kate, you have that at the Big Care. You, you have a tangible representation of, what, of your model already. It's been there for 39 years. So that makes it easier. So what is your, let's go into the future now, looking at the time, we have a few minutes left. So what's the next chapter? If we're, where do you go from here to be future ready? Well, I think, you know, really focusing on community resiliency and one of the interesting things about the Carrot Cash Grant, for example, and I encourage people, you know, I can't get into all of it right now, but go and look them up. Um, they are really, they are focused on thinking about barriers, thinking about who doesn't have access to funding typically. So these are projects that are really innovative and not getting funded elsewhere. It's not big recognizable organizations that get funding year after year after year. So I think, you know, they've, for example, they've funded, I think over 450 projects in the last 10 years. Um, and we're talking, you know, $1.5 million that's been given to all of these different projects. And that's going to build resiliency, right? It's not just one person doing one thing. Right. It's a bunch of different innovators um, tackling different issues. So it's, it's, um, it's not just about food access. It's also about, um, you know, growing differently, thinking about um, culturally diverse food, which was mentioned in another uh, one of the panel discussions. So it's, it's really targeting a lot of different, different things, yeah. Thank you. Now looking ahead, different question. Let's imagine, which I hope it never happens, that a city gets wiped out because of a storm. It's shut down for a week. How do we, how do we, put the, how do we have some kind of food reserve for that? It, it might happen, hopefully it doesn't. But with all with the you know the extreme weather, the different storms we're experiencing, the power outages, but maybe not a week, maybe for three or four days. Um, how do we prepare for that? What's one thing we can talk about or suggest rather? Anybody? Again, thinking future. Yeah. So I mean, that's all we do. <laughs> that is the whole point of our business is helping cities with that. And here's the thing, it's not going to be days. It's no longer days. There is no storm. If it's a major storm, um, it's going to be lots of days. And depending on your neighborhood, it's going to be weeks. And so you need a better plan. Will there be food on hand? Not food in the grocery stores. That is still a just-in-time delivery model. They have very thin margins. They're not going to change that or they're going to be out of business. The government is not going to start stockpiling food because we're already in an inflationary environment and a recession. Right. So the solution is you have lots of other assets. And when we look globally in countries, what they're doing is, right, that food waste channel, they, right, they, they all of a sudden they're going to restaurants, they're, they're leveraging their food carts, they're leveraging anyone who can produce food locally and produce food under these conditions, they're going out regionally to the farms. What we're advocating is, is to have all that mapped out and have those opportunities for a 20 mile hit event, a hundred mile hit event, et cetera. So you know where to go instead of taking critical days and weeks to figure out where to find the food. What people forget is in the emergency food situation, hunger and thirst happen very quickly. They happen faster than governments can respond. And so all that's happening is that nonprofits, the really, really tiny lo local nonprofits, like Kate was talking about, others are talking about, that's who's coming to the rescue. As everyone knows, it's not sustainable, it's not scalable, it's right. So right. we just need something else. And that that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you. And Mike, you want to comment on that or Phil? Phil. Sorry, my, right. my, my new button Mike. was hidden there. <laughs> Mike went first and then Phil. All right. I, I mean, I, when we were, when I was wearing just Thank my you. energy development hat, obviously microgrids, um, ability to island and power. Again, I, I, I think where, where Kim's referring to, I actually was writing, just jotting down the 10, 20 mile circles. I, I mean, a hundred mile circles. I think that's really right. something we don't think a lot about, but right. certainly from our cold climate situation, like the, the in the winter, like that, that will really exasperate some of those, right. those problems. And it was the ice storm that is our, you know, collective memory and example up here that mm -hmm. uh, that wiped that out and warming centers and microgrids and ability to power and provide, you know, right. if you've got meats, you probably want to cook them all up first so that they're going to store longer. And I'm just sort of thinking around that. And that's, that's how, I guess, where a lot of this agrivoltaics discussion is going around is trying to make some of these farming operations essentially energy islands that they can 
that they can um, operate independent of the grid or, or start to defect from the grid more is that a goal unto itself rather than rather than from a resiliency perspective but right. that's my little my little bit there yeah and mike i'm oh, sorry i, I just think ahead. that's absolutely right and i think what's going to be important then is and we're seeing this happening now right where like in the um in the us we have the baby infant formula shortage and they're asking one company to expand production the same thing would happen in a true food shortage so Mike, any of those islands that could produce are all of a sudden going to be asked to maximize production. Right. So having those plans in place, right? Like how could that happen very quickly, I think is just part of the planning process. I, I agree. Phil? You, you... Um, yeah, I, I echo the, the, the other speakers so a point of view. Like uh, I look at uh, uh, distributed food systems. We, we don't put everything on the same basket, you know, if, if anything wrong, uh, um, that's it. But how, how about we make every building, we make every household, they have the capacity to produce some food. Okay, this is one. And two, our Brampton project, in fact, it is an off-grid food shed, uh, totally powered by solar PV. So um, it was not damaged by, up by the storm, okay? So it's, you know, so so I think this is doable that we can put something like that, you know? So, for, you know, to, to plan ahead for future and we know that this kind of crazy extreme weather is going to be a new normal, right? So. Thank you for that, Phil. I, another question came up in the chat and that's about at the end. So what about food waste? So we may have food scarcity in, in the case of a disaster, but what about food waste? That, that's a question that came up in the chat. How do we minimize food waste? How do we repurpose some of the food that, how do we rescue the food? Like, like a second harvest, for example, rescues food and brings it to food bank. That's one model. Anything else that you want to build on? That's one of the things we're trying to collect right now is where is are some of these tactics. Um, again, we, we heard of some interesting things happening in Syria when they had all these refugees come in and they all of a sudden, you know, had a, you know, to feed 1 million more people. This idea of helping households capture their food waste and all of the restaurants capture their food waste, right, to then bring those in other places. And that is, like everything else, it becomes a logistics problem and a resource problem. And so right. they, they have been solved. One of the problems, and again, this is why we created, uh, are trying to create a bigger platform is, People in cities are incredibly resilient, nonprofits incredibly resilient. They solve the problem in the moment and then the crisis goes away and those tactics are lost. And then another crisis happens and everyone's so amazing, they do it all over again. So what we're trying to do is right after the crisis is capture those so that people can start to put them into plans, right? right? But people are doing all sorts of things. They're doing it very manually. They're using WhatsApp, they're using, Right, all sorts of different platforms to help people access what was going to be wasted food in scarce when it when it's scarce. Thank you, Kim. Another uh, comment here I'm seeing in the chat is how do we going back to the demand or consumer side is have people buy more intelligently so they buy what they need as opposed to overbuying. That was a comment. Any comment there? I think it's really important to contextualize our groceries. So we need to be thinking when we're, you know, in the grocery aisle, how does this product that I'm picking, you know, how does it affect the environment? How does it affect my community? Who grew it? Who made it? Um, so we have systems in place like the localized program that highlight, um, you know, locally owned, locally produced, and then, you know, bigger, broader systems like, you uh, certified organic and non-GMO, but I think it's really important to just continue that education piece so people aren't just thinking, you know, what's the cheapest product on the shelf? It's where is this coming from and why am I, why am I buying this particular item? Right. And back to the food waste too, I just wanted to mention, I think it's interesting to think about the companies, you know, like Spent Goods that spoke last week. There's another company, um, that was funded through the Carrot Cash that's using um, spent. Yeah, spent. Yeah. And there's another company that's making um, like preserves and things with 
um, I think fruits and stuff that wouldn't normally be sold. So I think looking at those companies that are able to scale up a little bit more, I mean, that's not Kim's sort of level of scale we need, but it's, you know, it's it another, everywhere. It's important. Yeah. It's interesting. It all adds up, right. Yeah. To support the businesses that are trying to, to create those solutions. Yeah. We have one closing question for everyone. This is where we go into the imagination. So put on your, your futurist hat. It's five years from now. What's one thing that's been achieved, been put in place when you're on your wish list? And so what is it and what's the problem or the opportunity that it, that it uncovers? Who wants to go first? It's five years from now. It's 2027 and you're looking back and saying, we did what? And what was the problem that it addressed or the opportunity that it un unlocked? I'll jump in and just say, you know, the big carrot model of being very community centric is not easy to do. You know, we have we have been very successful for for many years, but we now have apps and Amazon and all. You know, people are ordering their groceries from their couch, and I think for me, like the future vision is really is going back into what we were doing, really community centered, um, and. It can sound sort of idyllic, but I think it's really, it's powerful and you can have a lot of political shifts and a lot of bigger things happening when you're planting trees with your four-year-old and when you're talking to, you know, sixth graders about what the heck a GMO is and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So for me, it's, it's really, it's connecting people back in, like I said, where, what bigger um, system is your, you know, Apple part of and what, what are your grocery decisions doing for the planet, for your community? Yeah, so getting people more engaged on that level is what so I So five like. years from now, that's already happened. Mm -hmm. And then what's the outcome of that? What's the impact of that? Well, the impact is that you have, you know, you have resilient farming methods happening. So you have regenerative agriculture happening. You have farms supported that are doing right. the right thing, that aren't spraying, that are thinking about, you know, not tilling and, and, um, and like supporting soil health and all, you know. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. But thank you very much. Anybody else want to, Kim? Yeah, I would say five years from now, we will change the narrative. So every, everyone understands what sustained emergency food is. Cities have built uh, permanent new agencies and departments that will lead the sustained emergency food planning efforts and so they can mobilize those resources. Thank you. And Phil, thank you, Kim. Phil? Five I years dream, from now? My dream in, in, uh, in uh, five years, every condominium, every apartment, every uh, home, e every house has a farm in there. Okay, so every house, household, they be able to grow some food in an organic way. And we are doing it now, you know, uh, slowly, fairly slowly, grad, gradually. And so I think the, it's-, it's so What's the impact of that? So it's five years from now that's in place. What's the impact of that? Well, you know what, food diversity. Food let, diversity. Let okay. me tell you this. One of my projects, okay, when we start up, then we grow lettuce. The community people said, I don't like lettuce. I don't like it. Well, now I know. <laughs> so means we grow food for people. We, we don't grow food for anything else. So, so means, five years from now, that's in place. Fantastic. Would that be, that could be amazing. What about yourself, Mike? Yeah, I mean, my goal would be to see a disruption of the 40 million acres that are, that are currently in North America being utilized to grow ethanol. Um, so, you know, freeing up that for food crop uh, reducing the cost of food potentially uh, globally um, and uh, leading, you know, demonstrating that there's a pathway to, to essentially extinguishing the ethanol for car fuel market um, is, uh, uh, is, that's my aspirational goal. That's and and well, achieving I that, so 40, 40 million acres, you need about 20,000 today acres in solar to, to offset that at a, if you're factoring that 200 time multiple um, ethanol efficiency to solar efficiency per acre. So it's- and what's the impact of that? One. What's the impact of that vision that's come to life in five years from now? Well, the impact is uh, is 40 million acres that aren't being, having pounds and uh, billions of tons of uh, fertilizer and uh, 
pesticides dumped in them. You're, you know, okay. if you are, if you are harvesting, um, well, I think the impact of, again, reduced deforestation, they'll argue it's not here, but elsewhere, um, because it's a domino effect. Yeah. It's a domino yeah. effect for sure. Yeah. That's my, that's my big one. Thank you. Another vision uh, that has been put forward, and I'll just summarize it for the sake of time, is that five years from now, there are a number of eco partnerships uh, across the country and across the US at a community level or a city level or both. And that eco partnership are people who, who are the enablers, so that's policymakers, planners, makers, shaker, anybody who's part of the whole supply chain, as well as technology experts. So they're working together in partnership versus working in silos. And I'll give one quick sidebar thing here very quickly. When RSI started 11 years ago, sustainability was something on the side and, and then corporations versus my background. It was basically top down looking at how do you save money? Now it's more integrated into all aspects of business and society, which is amazing. So a lot can happen quickly. Things are happening faster now. So five years from now, all of your wishes I would imagine, not with certainty, but more certainty than it would have said two or five years ago, it's probably gonna happen. So thank you all very much for being so inspirational um, and thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Yasmin, and thank you. Thank you kindly to all the speakers um, for, for your candor. Um, and uh, and taking the time and uh, painting your your vision um, very much appreciated. So thank you, Phil, Mike, Kim, and Kate uh, for for that. I mean, I think some of the stuff that Kim has been early to identify um, and and key in on um, is is extremely relevant right now, and and they're. There is nothing like the power of a crisis to motivate, um, and it, it does seem crazy that we we aren't taking, uh, you know, when when these crises are now becoming more predictable, that we aren't taking lessons learned. So, encouraged uh, by by some of the thinking from all of our panelists on that on that front. Um, and so uh, this is the the final uh, installment of the web series. Um, we are in the process already of culminating all the knowledge that our expert panelists have brought to the, the fore um, and will we'll culminate in a Insights for Action playbook, um, which we're hoping, ambitiously hoping to have ready um, in mid-June so that the information is, uh, is there for you um, while some of the conversations are still fresh in your mind uh, and uh, we can continue on this action learning journey um, that's, uh, that we're, we're hoping we're all on together. Uh, and finally, thank you kindly to our sponsors. Uh, High Garden, thank you again, Phil. Uh, First Green Energy, Mike, uh, the Feeding Cities Group, Kim, um, Big Carrot. Uh, there are some uh, discount codes for Big Carrot and the spent goods uh, that are, I believe, expire at the end of the month. So hurry up and, and uh, use those. And, and um, thank you kindly to all the sponsors uh, for your support. We can't, can't do it without you. So thank you kindly. And just in closing, uh, so thank you again to everyone. I'm Patrick Gossage, my email's there. We are, are uh, very focused on collaboration uh, at RSI. So please feel free to reach out uh, if there's any initiatives or you wanna lend your voice. Uh, we encourage uh, as many reach outs as possible. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, finally, all. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you.